touched me, oh, he touched me. Yeah. Aren't you happy for that guy? Well, I hope after, after the message today, you'll be even happier for that guy. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. It says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. There was a woman, she had an issue of blood for twelve years. She needed to be healed. And she saw Jesus. It was hard for her to get to him. He was becoming a local celebrity. Yeah. And so she said, I have to get near him. And she saw him, and she was able to get as far as the hem of his garment. Think about the faith that this woman had. She said, I don't need Jesus to come and hold my hand. I don't need Jesus to come and to pray over me or to anoint me with oil. Yeah. I need to just get and touch the hem, just the outer part. If I could just but touch my finger at the end of the edge of his garment, that is enough. That is all that it will take for me to be healed. Wow. What faith that took. And was her faith rewarded? Uh -huh. It was. Was she healed? Uh -huh. Yes, she was. And Jesus corrected her later and said, Just so you know, it's not my garment. Yeah. It's not the hem of my garment that hey. healed you. It was your faith that even touching the hem of my garment right. could heal you. For example, uh, Peter, when he, later in the New Testament, it says that they would lay the sick out in the street. And just as Peter's shadow would come over those sick people, what would happen? They would be healed. The Bible doesn't actually say they would be healed, but we presume that their faith was rewarded as well. If just the shadow of Peter could touch these sick people, they would be healed. It was not the power of Peter's shadow yeah. or the power of the hem of the garment of Jesus. It was the faith in God that provided the healing. Sometimes we take something, an item or an object, and we ascribe, that means we transfer from something else to it, a special place that it does not belong. Yeah. So we see, of course, the Catholics do this all the time. They have idols. They yeah. have relics. And they take these things and they say they ascribe, they transfer what belongs to God away from God into an object and they cling to this object and say, by touching this object, I will be healed. Yeah. Where is the power? Where does the power lie? No longer in God, but the power will lie in the object if you put your dependence in that object. And so this woman says the power is of God. He has such power that if I could just but touch the hem of his garment. That was a great amount of faith and Jesus rewarded her faith and he was impressed by it. So isn't it great that we can sing the song, We Touched Him. That is a good thing to be able to say that we went to Jesus Christ and we touched Him. What do you think happened more in the ministry of Jesus Christ? More times is it that people touched Him or that He touched people? What do you think was more common? More times recorded Jesus touching people, but there were times, a couple of times, where different multitudes of people came and touched Jesus. The most common form that people were healed in the ministry of Jesus is not Jesus touching them. Those are recorded more. There were seven times that I counted Jesus touching someone. But it was people touching Jesus. That happened in multitudes. Wow. Multitudes. But who do you think? Who do you think had the greater faith? Those that were the faith the same like the multitudes? Or those that those seven that said that Jesus could come and touch me? Now you're not in a group of multitudes anymore. You're just one of the seven. Okay, now there might have been others. I did this kind of a quick study. But let's turn back one chapter. In Matthew chapter 8, we see this is recorded in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the first instance when Jesus ever, it is ever recorded that Jesus touched somebody. In Matthew chapter 8, where Jesus actually touched somebody. The book of Matthew presents Jesus Christ as a king. 
if Jesus Christ touches someone, or if a king touches someone, it would matter, don't you think? So that's why Matthew records often Jesus touching people. Because he says he's like a king. Just his touch wow. is like the Midas touch. It turns things Amen. to gold. And then in the book of Mark, Jesus is presented as a servant. What is the most important thing about a servant? It is, what, is it his ideas or his words? What is it that a servant is hired to do? Not to think. Right, Brother Sheen? When you go to work... And she says, boss, I got this great idea. He gets the whiteboard out. He starts drawing up stuff on the whiteboard. And the boss says, she, I don't pay you to think. I'm your boss. You're the servant. Now go start doing stuff. Not thinking so much. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you, she. Right? But the servant is not paid to think, to come up with ideas, or to talk to the boss. The servant doesn't need to speak or to think. The servant uses his hands. So a servant uses his hands to touch things. So often in the book of Mark, it talks about Jesus touching people. And in the book of Luke, it presents Jesus as, as a perfect man. And what do men do to things? They touch things. They touch things. So Luke, uh, more than Mark and more than Matthew, he showed Jesus touching people, touching things, physically, with his hands. And the book of John presents Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Yes. God, a spirit. So John never once ever records Jesus ever touching physically with his hands anybody. The only time the word touch is ever recorded in the book of John is when Jesus tells Mary Magdalene after the resurrection, touch me not. Don't touch me. Why? Because he's presenting Jesus Christ as the Son of God. When we go out and we do door to door and we evangelize, are we presenting ourselves as the Son of God or as a servant of God? A few of you said Son of God, so we need to talk. The rest of you, good job. Servant of God, right? We're not walking out. David thinks he's the Son of God out there, right? So you can get touched, you can get healed by touching Christ. <laughs> or, like that guy who likes to sing that song, He Touched Me, Oh, He Touched Me, we can have Jesus come and touch us. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When He was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed Him, and behold, there came a... Ew! Disgusting! A what? A leper. A leper. How many of you in this room have touched a leper? Raise your hand. You were from Father. Yes, I have touched lepers. <laughs> yes, I have touched many lepers with my hands. Yes, but um, that's not what the message is about. Me touching lepers, okay? Lepers are disgusting. Okay? It's a bacterial disease, and I used to live in Tala, where there is a big leper colony. Well, they call it leprosarium. They don't put them in colonies anymore. <laughs> And you could smell from my house on a rainy day a good two kilometers away. You could smell the flesh rotting. You could smell the leprosy from that far away. It's disgusting. You could you notice a leper first by the smell long before you're going to see them. Whoa. They stink. Whoa. And they need help. Wherever they go, they need someone to guide them. Nobody is going, no one in their right mind, which I am not, apparently, because I have touched <laughs> many lepers, but nobody in their right mind wants to touch a leper. If Jesus, the first person that he is going to Whoa. touch, who is it going to be? It's going to be a king. It's going to be the Roman emperor. Or is it going to be a leper? A leper? Yes, the first person that Jesus ever touched is a leper. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and ew, touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And, his, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And later Jesus says, as is according to your faith, I give it. In other words, he says, as much faith as you have in me, that's how much you're going to get. 
And that's the same way for us. As much faith as we put in, upon God, that's how much God is going to deal back to us. It would be foolish to put all of your eggs in one basket. You ever hear that expression? In America, we used, if, if you're going to play sports, you would say, well, I've got this one guy, and he's my whole team. If he gets injured, the team is done for. Uh -huh. And then you would say, well, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Uh -huh. And that's just good advice. It would be foolish, worldly speaking, it is foolish to place all of your dependence and all of your faith in Jesus Christ alone. Worldly speaking, world wisdom, you should spread it out. Put a little in this guy, a little in your works, a little in your church, a little money for the orphanage, a little for Jesus Christ. Let's put that all together and let's not put all of our faith in Jesus Christ. As much as you put your faith in Christ, it will be given back to you. If you don't put all of your faith in Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation in heaven, if you come short of that, what are you going to come short of when it comes back to you? What? What blessing? Let me, let me again. Let's say that you want a car. Okay? So you say, God, I'm going to depend on you for the need of a car. It's just a want. Forget it. But you say, I really need a car. I think you want me to have a car. God, I'm going to depend upon you 90% and to my, my uh, Ninong for 10%. How much is God at a maximum going to give to reward your faith? Only 90%. Right? And then your Ninong might let you down. So that's what I'm saying. According to your faith, that measure, that amount, it's going to be given back to you. What about our eternal destiny in uh -huh. heaven or hell? How much of our dependence in order to get eternal life in heaven, what percentage of our dependence in, in Christ to go to heaven, if it's 99%, we're just short of 100% dependence in Jesus Christ to go to heaven, what amount will we come short of heaven. If it's 99% faith in Christ, 1% faith in works, how short are we going to come of attaining heaven? What percentage? Do the math. 100%. 1%, which is 100%. If you come 1%, if you miss heaven by 1%, where do you spend eternity? In hell. Yeah, you wish. Right. So there... According to your faith, it's measured to you. Right. So you can go and touch Jesus and be healed, and that's rewarded. Or even better, you can have Jesus touch you. And those are the ways that people are healed. Mm -hmm. RJ, which one would you choose? Would you choose for someone for you to go and touch Jesus, or would you choose for Jesus to come and touch you? Which one do you think is better? Evangelist, it's better to not bother the master. Like, you mean him not touch you and you not touch him at all? It's better just to not bother him at all? Well, what about Matthew 8, 10? Matthew 8, 10. Let's look. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. It talks about a man, centurion, verse 8. And in verse 10 it says, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto him, them that followed him, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. What was this faith? RJ just discovered the third way to be healed. Amen. The only time in the entire ministry of Jesus Christ there was this one time. Thank you, RJ. You're exactly right. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. It says, The sin. So, uh, verse 5, And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. So Jesus was going to come and touch him. The John Locke way. But then there's an RJ way even better. <laughs> the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. 
but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. See what kind of faith a man of God like this centurion and RJ have. They said, why trouble the master? Why bother him? The centurion said, you know what, Jesus? You touched Peter's mother-in-law. You touched the leper. The centurion says, I know. I know what it takes for you to heal. You don't need to touch him. Jesus said, okay, I'll go touch him. And the centurion said, how about this? I'll depend on not just the hem of your garment, I'll just depend on the word from your mouth. Wow. Just a thought, and that's what I'll depend on. And Jesus says, I have not seen such great faith. He's wow. the only one that had that much faith. Everyone else said, Christ, I have enough faith that if you touch me, you will heal me. Others said, I have enough faith that if I touch him, I will be healed. Multitudes had that. But there was one man, the centurion, he says, I love that song. Oh, he touched me, oh, he touched me. That's a great song. But that centurion says, wouldn't it be better if Jesus just spoke the word and let him have his time to heal someone else that has less faith? Think of the faith that has to be healed. Just to say, Christ, I depend alone on your word. Wow. What do we have today? That's what do we have? We have it right here. Do you need Jesus Christ to come and touch you? No, you have his word. Do you need Jesus? Do you need to go and touch Jesus Christ? You don't need idols. You don't need relics. You don't need paintings. Oh, you don't need any of those things. You only need to trust and depend upon the touch of his word. So when that guy sings, oh, he touched me. Yes, he did. But I've been touched only by the word. And that's all we need. I don't need a vision. I don't need a dream. I don't need a gift of miracles, prophecies, tongues, interpretation. I don't need to get bit by a poisonous serpent and did not kill me for me to know that what God says is true. I don't need it. I don't need to be touched. I just need his words. And that's what I have. Wow. So do you have that faith? Do you have the faith of that woman who touched the garden? Do you have more faith? The faith of the evangelist John Blanke? Or do you have the faith of like this man right here? Wow. Wow. Three months ago when I met him, he was a boy. Today, this is a man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, Pastor's going to talk about humility. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> now we built him up. Now we talk about humility. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, evangelizing now. Amen. The uh, part two. So I need a joke to transition. <laughs> I had to do that last Sunday school a week or two ago. I needed a joke to transition from one to the other. So there was a man uh, that died, and at the funeral, his widow had the funeral, and one of this man's friends came to the widow and said to the widow. Um, you know, he's a good friend of mine. Do you mind if I speak at the funeral service? And the widow said, you're a good friend of his. That would be great. I don't mind at all. Please do. So during the funeral service, the man went up and he said, bargain. And then he went and sat down. After the funeral was over, the widow said, thank you so much. That really meant a great deal. <laughs> no, Len? No? Let him even up. Even a courtesy laugh? No. <laughs> Not even a courtesy laugh. Okay, well that failed. Okay? That failed miserably. <laughs> so now, let's turn quickly to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. I don't have to explain it, right? You get it? <laughs> I did not get it. Oh, really? <laughs> he went there and he said, bargain. Right? And then in America, if you say, Oh, thank you, brother. That really meant a great deal. <laughs> what am I saying? I'm touched. It really meant a great deal. What does the word bargain mean? Great deal. It means a great deal. So that's... <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to go through a gospel track. If I were to write a track, this is how it would look like, well, specifically right. tailored to the Catholic. All right? If I had to write a track specifically for a Catholic, this is what it would look like. First, I wouldn't turn there because everybody knows it. The fact, they might not know the verse, but it says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. 
Good. So you can say Hebrews 9.27 or you can just say it. Because every, you do not need to spend a long time convincing someone that one day they're going to die. Yeah. They know. Okay, so don't spend a long time on it. So how about this? Why don't I just do a, what do you call it, but it's like a rehearsal type thing, okay? I'll be the evangelist. I'll take the name evangelist John Blanc. <laughs> make that up, okay? And you be the wicked, corrupt, pagan, filthy, disgusting, idolatrous, uh, pagan, Filipino Catholics, okay? Good job. All right, way to stay in character. You're doing good. Okay. So knocking on your door, and I say, and, and this is what, you know, if we can when we're going door to door, this is what I want you to get to. Someone open the door. Now, Paul. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello, stop. Gotta get cold. Buy some Baptist Church, uh, Society Bible Baptist Church, Manila. If they're still awake after that long name. A <laughs> co-I evangelist, John Blondie, got a Society Bible Baptist Church, Manila. And I am here. My job is to teach the gospel. That is the good news. Have you ever heard the gospel before? Does this sound familiar, Vincent? Yeah. yeah. Vincent's baby. Sleep. And he sees uh, Mario collecting coins and then he hears the over, <laughs> right? And they will say, what do you think? What are they going to say? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. So I would like to share the gospel. It won't take long. Are you busy right now? Is it okay if I share a few verses? No, no it's okay. Okay, if they say no, you give them the track and you say, this is my cell phone number on the back. When you're not busy, please give me a call or a text. I will be happy to come back when you are not busy. All right? If they say no, that's not just them saying no. It's Satan. It's the demon. It's the devil. It's the flesh also saying no. You're not going to break that down. Just go to the next one. All right, don't stick your foot in the door. Don't you close that door, Satan. Okay. Just say, okay, there's other doors. If there's only one door left in the whole world, then fight for that door. But as far as I know, there's others. Okay, so if they say, no, I'm busy. Just go to the next door. All right, so they said, not yet. Do you mind? I just share with you briefly what the Bible says about the good news. The good news is how we can go to heaven. The Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. The gospel will prepare you for that judgment. The best way to give the gospel, the best way to teach, is always by asking questions. Stay away from the why questions. Why? Because they don't know. How would they know the answer of why? They don't know, they don't know their Bible. That's your job to teach them. So stay away from the why question. So you say, I'm here to teach you the gospel. The point of the man must die. And after this, the judgment. The gospel is what prepares us for the judgment. So what is going to happen to you, according to the Bible, after you die? The judgment. And then you say this question. When you stand before God at the judgment, He will ask you, why should I allow you to come into my heaven? What would you say? Or what will you say? Good. Good words. What else? Kathy's going to say it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I haven't got that one yet. It's cute. I know. Alright, what are they going to say? Church attendance. Church attendance of eBay. Uh, the sal. Of an ed. Good thing want, right? So all these different things. Minya, right? Familia. They say all these things. You say, okay. So, and then you summarize. So what you are saying is you are depending on your Mabutu Gawa. Yes, because I'm a good person. Blah blah blah. Do not tell them. You let them tell you. Don't give them a list. Are you depending on what even Mabahit Mabasal Binya? Don't start doing that. Let them give the list to you because you will bring it up later. Then you turn them to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, and have them read it. But we are all as an unclean thing. The Bible says we are all unclean. Does that mean that I am unclean? Yes, it does. Are you unclean? 
Yes, if I told you I am clean, will you believe me or will you believe the Bible? So according to the Bible, we are all unclean. Do you think that heaven is a place of cleanness or uncleanness? Cleanliness. Do you think that is a problem? Hmm. The answer is yes, that's a problem. It's clean in heaven, we're not clean. Continuing on. It says, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy right, are as filthy rags. Your righteousnesses, your makutingawa, are as parang marumi basaha. That's what the Bible says. Filthy rag, marumi basaha. Do you then you you say that statement? Make that clear. Don't ask them if they think it's true or not. Just say that's what the Bible says. Then you go checking if they believe it. Then think of a place like near here, um, SM. Do you ever go to SM? Yes. What do you take to get to SM? Jeep. A jeepney. What do you give the jeepney driver for him to take you to SM? How much? Nine pesos now. <laughs> so what if you were to give the jeepney driver marumi pasaha? What if only what? Don't ask why. Uh, just say, what would be the reaction of the driver if you were to offer him filthy rags? Angry. Got it. That will be the reaction. So, if the reaction is he will be angry, ask him this question. Do you think that filthy rags is good enough to get you a ride to SM? No. No. Then why do you think it is good enough to get you into heaven? Uh -huh. They don't like that question. Okay? They don't like that question. And then they say, well, I, I, I don't know, they'll stammer and stutter something, and then ask them the follow-up and said, what do you think God's reaction is going to be when you offer Him filthy rags for entrance into His perfect home? And again, they won't be able to answer but they will be able, they will start to think, well, maybe it's not my good words. Uh, let's just do five more minutes. Matthew chapter uh, 7. Then you turn them to Matthew chapter 7. Verse number 20. Now remember, at that day, the judgment day, Jesus speaks a lot about that day. And he warns us, he wants us to be prepared for that judgment day. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Jesus is speaking about that day. Or, sorry, verse 21. Uh, sorry, actually, verse 22. It says, Many will say to me in that day, What day is this? <laughs> the judgment day. Good. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, that means to preach, in thy name? Whose name did they do the preaching in? <laughs> Lord Jesus. Is that a good work or a bad work? <laughs> a very good work. And in that name have cast out devils. Whose name did they cast out the devils? Jesus. Did they do it for their own pride? No, they did it for Jesus. Did they do it to get rich or famous? No, they did it because they loved Jesus. Is that a good work or a bad work to cast out devils? Very good work. And in thy name done many wonderful works. These wonderful works were done in whose name? In the name of Jesus. So these works, casting out devils, preaching in His name, and many wonderful works, these are good works. What do you think God is going to say to these men? Is He going to say, come into my heaven, receive your reward, thank you for all the work that you did for me in my oh. name? Or will God say, I don't know who you are, depart from me, and you are going to have to, I will have to send you to hell. What do you think God is going to do? Remember, you're a Catholic. Oh, yes. Ten times out of ten, they're going to say what? Heaven. Huh? Heaven. heaven. Yeah, they're going to say, ah, the first one, where God says, come into the heaven. And then you say, don't tell them the answer, just say, well, let's find out. Let's read the next verse and see what Jesus said. 22. Uh, verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Say that nice and slow so it sinks in. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So where did they go? Heaven or hell? Hell. hell. 
were these men that did good works or bad works? What were these men depending on? Their good works. What does God call the good works? Paranggito o marumin basal? Marumin basal. I've already forgotten by that point, believe me. Okay? Marumin basahan. So let me ask you this question. These men are depending on good works just the same as you are depending upon your good works. What makes you special that you get to go to heaven while these men went to heaven? Uh, ask them that question. And then we're, we'll go ahead and finish up. Uh, this isn't the end, but we'll go ahead and stop for the afternoon. Let's go up a few verses and they won't be able to answer that. Because they'll say, well, these men's works were better than mine. I never cast out devils. I don't preach in the name of Jesus. I have not done many wonderful works like these men. I need to be better than these men, and I'm not. So then you turn back a few verses, same chapter, verse 13, enter ye, and then you ask this, do you think most people will go to heaven or hell? Most people will say that most people go to heaven. So then you turn it to verse 13, same chapter, Matthew 7. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, Marwag, broad is the way, Mahaba, that leadeth to destruction. And many there be, Maramintal, which be, uh, which there be, which go in thereat. So most people, Maramintal, go to heaven or to hell. According to this verse, they go to hell. Let's look at the next verse. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. How many people go to heaven? Many or few? How many people go to hell? Many or few? Many. So that means these people here that you listen to, that you know, your neighbors, your loved ones, these here around us, most of them are going to heaven according to the Bible, or most of them are going to hell. Hell. Then what is special about you? That you get to go to heaven, and all these people around you, most of them are going to go to hell. And they're going to think for a while, and they're finally going to come to the conclusion that there is nothing special about them. And it's going to lead them to the conclusion that they are one of the many. Just like those two men who did many good works, they are one of the many that are going to go to hell when they die. Make sure, and then oftentimes, before they finally admit that, they'll throw out a few more things, like, I love God, or but I'm good to my family, or but I pray, every day I pray. And that say, and so also did these men. So, and then say, and a lot of times they will say, because Jesus loves me, or because I love Jesus, and then ask them this, or they'll say, because I want to go to heaven. So you say, the ones that entered in the wide gate that went to hell, did Jesus love them? The ones that went through the wide gate and sent, were sent to hell, did Jesus love them? Yes. Did they want to go to heaven? Did no. they go to heaven? No. no. So unless you're different than them, just because Jesus loves you and you want to go to heaven, does not mean that you are going to go to heaven. Alright, so can anyone tell me the three verses? You can, Isaiah 64, 6. Matthew 7, 23, 22 and 23. And Matthew 7, 13 and 14. You get those verses and the heavy lifting is done. Alright? And then from conversations, sometimes I go to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Romans 11, 10, other ones. But if you can remember those verses, that will give you 90% of the way to them realizing that they are lost. Once they realize they are lost, you are now past the 99% mark. The rest, Jesus died on the cross for the sins. They're already Catholic. They already know that. They already believe it. He's the Son of God. They know it. He loves them. He has the power to take them to heaven. But getting them to detach themselves from their dependence and their good works, that's, that's where all the work is. You get there, you're most of the way. Good. Pastor. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
except for the joke that we did not understand. <laughs> so good, napakaganda. Baon-baon natin yung isang mensahe na paghayo natin lahat sa labas, kailangan maintindihan ng tao na siya'y makasalanan, siya'y mamamatay at mapaparusahan sa impyerno. Tama po? At may nag-iisang tagapagligtas, may nag-iisang paraan ang pananalig ng buong pananampalataya kay Yesu Kristo na tagapagligtas. Amen?